Well, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the 2022 NAIC International Insurance Forum. This is our first <clears throat> since 2019. Uh, you'll hear that a lot, and that's because we're very excited uh, to be back. <clears throat> I've already seen a few of my, my European colleagues and friends that have made the trip. Thank you for, for doing so. We very much appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I wore some bright colors or some fun colors this morning with the, the goal of keeping the spring weather here or maybe bringing it back to Boston with me. Um, but as soon as the first person saw me, they asked if I was colorblind. <clears throat> so <laughs> I like it, you may not, whatever. Um, my name is Gary Anderson. I'm the commissioner uh, from the Massachusetts Division of Insurance. I also chair the NAIC's International Insurance Relations Committee. Um, we have a very full agenda over the next day and a half uh, for the NAIC's flagship international event. Um, so we're really pleased that you're uh, here with us. A, a couple of housekeeping remarks to kick us off. First, uh, an updated schedule as well as all the panelists' bios can be found in the event app. Um, second, for all our live panels, we do encourage you to submit your questions via Slido. <clears throat> you can access Slido by going to www sli.do um, and from your mobile device or laptop and it looks like everybody's got the the forum's event code which is 442308 442308 <clears throat> um, there are also some microphones available uh, throughout the ballroom for audience members to ask questions the old-fashioned way um, and then finally we'll want to make sure that we silence all of our our cell phones uh, so we don't disturb others around us so without uh, further ado, I'd like to get right into it and introduce Dean L. Cameron. D uh, Dean is the NAIC president and director of the Idaho Department of Insurance and one of two native-born Idahoans that will be on the stage. Uh, so to kick us off, my friend Dean. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate the the long introduction. Uh, Gary and I, uh, Gary, as you don't know, uh, comes from Idaho as well. So it's kind of fun that we share that, that uh, connection. He had uh, teased me earlier about he was going to say something about one of us being the older of the two. And uh, I promised that I wouldn't hold his youth and experience against him. Uh, well, good morning. Welcome to the 2022 International uh, Forum. I'm, uh, as Gary said, I'm excited as well that this is our first since 2019. For the last uh, two years, we have had the forums interacting on almost a virtual basis, uh, which is difficult for uh, this community, frankly. Um, it is a community that is built on person-to-person, face-to-face uh, engagement. And when you think about it, the first insurance policies sold were neighbor to neighbor, or the first regulators were regulators in their own community. While insurance has become a global insurance business, uh, it is still very much a personal human experience. So it's with that and with that sincerity that I welcome you all here in person. And it is, in spite of these bright lights, it's very good to see uh, all of you. This year's International Forum is even more special as we welcome our friends near and from far. Uh, we have a sold out event uh, today, or at this event, at this forum. I'm happy to report that we have almost 300 participants representing 19 countries and five continents, and that's amazing. As we emerge out of the fog of the pandemic, I think we'd all hope to see a world that was back to normal, that we had lessons learned and that we could see clearly moving forward. While we have been able to demonstrate resiliency, prudent oversight, and flexibility, we're only able still to see so far. We have lingering uncertainty and unsettled questions, questions about the future, about the appropriate insurance regulation, about the availability of products that meet consumer needs, about the future 
of the insurance workforce in an increasingly virtual world. Despite these questions, as we emerge and learn to deal and adapt with COVID, we are seeing a world through fresh eyes. We are also inspired with the strength and the confidence uh, that having dealt with this very difficult, challenging situation. As leaders in this crucial sector, we have worked to keep our industry strong and our consumers protected. Despite the uncertainty, the industry did as it was designed to do. It provided per protection and provided peace of mind. In fact, in many areas, I have marveled at the industry as how they went above and beyond in helping protect consumers and helping the communities in which they reside overcome the challenges of this pandemic. Similarly, we look we took great satisfaction in the financial strength of our domestic market. That was tested simultaneously with a global pandemic, historic natural catastrophes, financial volatility, and social unrest. The last two years have in many cases been a worst case scenario for risk modeling. Now that our system has once again been put to the test, it's time to look forward and lay the groundwork for the next 10 years, which undoubtedly will have its new slate of challenges. Some of these challenges are already before us, and considerable attention needs to be placed to bear, not only at home, but internationally, such as the impact on technology and data and all as aspects of the sector, to financial inclusion and climate resiliency. In some ways, our post pandemic work will be just as complex and challenging as what we've accomplished over the last decade. The conversations, the collaboration, and the resolution will not be easy, but I have confidence that we can and will rise to the occasion and meet these newer breed of challenges just as we have in the past. The International Forum is our platform to draw attention to and gather insights on unique issues that supervisors and market participants around the world are wrestling with. The goal in these, discuss these discussions in this forum is to bring together different organizations, different perspectives, different voices, and different from different regions to provide the best solutions and answers to the problems. Since we're here at the nation's capital, not surprisingly, we may have some spirited discussions. Just as we have in the past, forums with preceding and settling policy mark, remarks. This clash of ideals occurs because we're all passionate about the issues insur uh, of ensuring the safety of markets and protecting consumers and future generations. My time in the industry has been long. Some of you know that I am a third generation uh, of my family that has worked in the insurance sector. And it is the an industry in which I am extremely passionate um, and have been for a long time. I have seen the benefits of the products offered in the industry. And I have also seen the demise of an insurer without appropriate safeguards and standards. I've had the privilege of serving as a state senator in my state. And as a senator, I was entrusted to find solutions and crafting legislation that advanced the needs of my constituents in my state. The process isn't always pretty. The sausage making, as we affectionately call it, while not appetizing at times, nor perfect, it encourages the sharing of opinions, ideals, and ideas. It fosters different voices being heard, considered, debated, and ultimately developed into law that govern the people. We understand the difficult issues cannot be resolved just without, we understand they can't be resolved without candid conversation. As a state commissioner and the NEIC president, I am humbled by the opportunity to utilize my experience along with 55 other dedicated and professional colleagues across the country. 
to lead the world's largest insurance market as part of the global community. As we look forward these coming days, I know that we will not solve all the problems. But hopefully through sharing, through candid conversation, we'll be a little closer to understanding and a little bit closer to compromise uh, that puts us on the right path. I'm pleased to say that at the NEIC, from my perspective, in 2022, we have been achieving collaboration and compromise on many issues. Let me give you a few examples. I'm sure many of you may have seen at last month's NEIC Spring National Meeting the launch of a new letter committee that focused on data, cybersecurity, and technology issues. This is a critical issue that we must address, especially at the global regulatory community. We are working on financial inclusion and representation in our sector. We are committed to find and remove barriers that keep our citizens from participating in the products offered by the industry, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or gender. Recently, the NEIC announced the NEIC Foundation to help individuals from underrepresented backgrounds obtain skills relevant to the regulation of insurance and the business of insurance. This is a wonderful opportunity to make a difference in the lives of students of different races, ethnicities, and genders. While there is growing focus on addressing new and emerging issues, we acknowledge efforts are still ongoing to address the, last, the lessons learned from the last financial crisis. Domestically and internationally, improvements have been made in insured governance, group supervision, macroprudential surveillance, and financial stability. Much has been done, but more needs to be done. To be completely honest and candid, one area that continues to be challenging is group capital, and specifically the development of the ICS. We have been clear at the NEIC from the beginning about our concerns to the reference ICS, and those concerns have not changed. Indeed, the more data and insight that we see, the stronger those concerns are. For this reason, we have worked with Team USA colleagues for an alternative path, the aggregation method, that we feel meets and exceeds the IAIS's objective of group capital for our IAIGs while respecting the jurisdictions who want to follow or prefer the ICS. We are pleased in 2019 to see the aggregation method recognized by the IAIS, leading to a comparability process to ensure consistent outcomes. Thus far, thus far however, we've been disappointed and saddened that we have been unable to reach agreement on the comparability criteria that reflects a, a viable path forward for the aggregation method which, in our opinion, directly threatens the foundation of our agreement in 2019 in Abu Dhabi. Respectfully, we have worked in good faith for years, and our industry has contributed to both the ICS and the AM in terms of data and feedback. But a flawed comparability process that undermines our proven capital regime is not something we will accept. Sadly, we are rapidly being pushed into a difficult decision on our direction with the ICS. Sincerely, we think this is a critical issue for ICS colleagues, IAIS colleagues, to understand and acknowledge our views and our challenges as we go forth in the forthcoming meetings in June. We have been very clear that if we have, if we have not reached agreement on comparability criteria, now long overdue, we would need to pivot. It is unfortunate and honestly disappointing that we find ourselves in this position. However, as I have experienced as a state senator, sometimes despite the best intentions and the best efforts, consensus can prove elusive. Those are learning opportunities, learning moments for any organization, and we should view these moments as opportunities to find real understanding and, and solutions. 
That is certainly our goal. I hope we all acknowledge and take some satisfaction how far we've come over the last decade. As a global community, we've made progress on key areas such as group supervision, enterprise risk management, regulatory cooperation, and yes, even capital requirements. We now live in a world where the US, the UK, the EU, Japan, Switzerland, Bermuda, and many other countries have a group capital standard. That's, that simply didn't exist a decade ago. Each of them have their own variation to a group capital, tailored to their specific market and conditions. And frankly, that should be okay. While the journey to consensus may still be ongoing, we are much farther down the road than we thought we would ever be. Despite our concerns with the ICS initiative, I need to be perfectly clear. We remain com committed to the, to the important future work of the IAIS. We remain dedicated to constructive engagement with our international colleagues on a host of issues. Our shared success depends on the shared commitment to compromise, collaboration, and learning from each other. Over the next day and a half, that's exactly what we hope to do. We will touch on a diverse array of topics, including views from industry leaders, issues impacting emerging markets, the roles of innovation, big data, and cybersecurity, new business models and ownership, climate risk and resiliency, and the work of the IAIS. We also have the honor of hearing from Major General John D. Altenberg in just a few moments on the war in, in Ukraine and the potential effects on security and financial markets. And tomorrow we'll have the privilege of hearing from Vicky Supporta from the Bank of England, and she will discuss the challenges to the industry in the near future and in the, in the distant future, sharing her insights as the chair of the IAIS Executive Committee. Now, I know that's a lot to digest, and I hope you'll find these discussions meaningful and helpful as you engage in these issues. I'd like to pause for a second and ask the NAIC team who has been, um, who have, have actively participated in organizing this event to stand. If we have any from the NAIC team, where are they? They're in the back. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you to the team for their hard work and for putting everything together. I think you'll find it to, uh, to be a wonderful forum. And thank you to all of you for being here. I look forward to visiting with you and, and getting to know you better and look forward to learning from the program myself. Thank you to all of you in the industry and all, all of you in the regulatory community for what you do to provide access to affordable coverage for our consumers throughout the world. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. This is what you get when you don't do this very often. I forgot my next part. The most important part of my remarks of today is the introduction of Major General John D. Altenberg, Jr. It is a great honor for me to introduce the forum's next keynote speaker. Major General John D. Altenberg, Jr., who will discuss the war in Ukraine and some of the effects that this will have on the global markets and security moving forward. This topic is a little bit of a departure from us in the NAIC, but we thought it would be an imperative address and something that's critical for us as we look into the future and as we watch the war unfold every day and we see the very real effects it's having on the world. General Altenberger comes to us from Greenberg Tariq, uh, where he is of counsel, focusing on his practice in corporate governance and, and sensitive internal investigations and defense of homeland security, in the defense of homeland security sector, and the multilateral development banks, bank sector. During his 28 years as a lawyer in the Army, he represented the Army before Congress, the state and local governments, and in court in the United States in Germany, in the United States and in Germany. He also advised counsel and negotiated at all levels 
of the Army, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Justice on matters of importance to the defense community, members of Congress, and the media. From 1997 to 2001, General Altenberg served as the Deputy Judge Advocate General for the Department of the Army, and he advised senior military and civilian leaders on critical legal and policy issues and directed the day-to-day -day operations of approximately 1,800 civilian um, and ununiformed un attorneys and, um, and 3,000 National Guard and Army Reserve attorneys worldwide. General Altenberg provides, uh, brings with him many years of experience on security and legal matters, and I look forward to hearing his views on the current situation. Please join me in welcoming General Altenberger. Hi there. <clears throat> I hope you weren't expecting somebody to be very formal just because I used to wear a uniform. Uh, thank you, President Cameron. I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate especially the, uh, I appreciate especially the, the invitation uh, to join you this morning and to share some of my thoughts about ongoing events in the world. Uh, so, so thank you to the NC, NAIC at large. Uh, and I've, I've already had a very uh, hospitable uh, welcome this morning from Stellar View as Fred has carried me around to as many tables as he can and introduced me to as many of you as possible. And, I look forward to meeting more of you. I, I, this is, as a keynote speech, I, I, I assumed uh, that there would be no Q&A, uh, uh, but I will be around in case anybody wants to ask me some questions for the rest of the morning. Um, I'd like to thank also uh, Fred especially for inviting me to do this. Uh, Fred's uh, a major domo in the Greenberg Trowering's Insurance Regulatory Practice, which is considerable, as I understand it. And uh, this is an admission against interest, Fred, because of my memory, but we've been talking for weeks about me doing this this morning. And never once in all of our conversations and emails did I think to tell Fred, hey, my youngest brother has an insurance practice in Florida, which is where Fred is. And so, you know, you're gonna ask me about what the heck are you thinking about, Altenberg? Why didn't you tell me that earlier? But that's, my brother's been down there in an insurance practice for at least 20 years. Uh, so, uh, so I have that connection to you guys. Um, <clears throat> I have to uh, offer this caveat, which I was quite accustomed to, to offering when I was uh, on active duty in the military. Uh, you know, these are my thoughts, my opinions. They in no way reflect the Department of Defense or the Department of the Army. And so uh, I still say that because my thoughts are my own and my opinions are my own, and they in no way reflect uh, Greenberg Traurig, my employer. So I want to make sure that, uh, that, that I let you know that. Um, I feel a, a, a connection somewhat to, to what's going on in, in, uh, in Ukraine because I've had the opportunity in the course of my career especially to meet uh, several people from Ukraine. I, I helped a... Uh, uh, a very special uh, counterterrorism non-commissioned officer in the 70s changed his name from John, which had become John when he came in as a four-year-old at Ellis Island, and I helped him do the name change in Cumberland County, North Carolina, to go back to his original name of Vladimir. And as it happens, he was from Donbass, uh, an area in, in somewhat uh, the news today. Uh, at another time, I was a senior lawyer counsel for a brigade commander in Germany uh, in the 3rd Armored Division in the late 70s and early 80s named Nicholas Krauchu, who was from Ukraine and who saw the front pass through his village on, on its way to uh, defeat the, the Nazi front going forward and then the front coming back as the Soviets came back and went on to Berlin. And uh, he, was a, he was a very special mentor of mine also. Uh, and as it happens, I've been thinking about this so I could talk to you, you, you folks this morning and I get a phone call on Saturday from a friend of mine who I served with and who was a part of the team that I used when we went to Haiti in 1994 on Operation Uphold Democracy with General Hugh Shelton. And this was a fellow that I had assigned to be the 
uh, advisor to the military intelligence brigade because I knew we were going to be doing detention operations and I wanted to have a lawyer there to help oversee the detention operations. Pete called me from Kiev four days ago. He's over there with a non-government organization from Great Britain trying to work on the rule of law, trying to get a meeting with the prosecutor general of Ukraine so that they can help investigate war crimes and do what's right. So the, 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 it's not an irony, but it's a coincidence that, that, uh, that all these, these people that have this connection to Ukraine, and he's from a family that left Ukraine in 1905, so it was very special to him to get back over there and, and try to help. Um, the last thing I'd tell you before I, I start talking about Ukraine and Russia and, and, and the significant factors in, our national, in the United States national security uh, policy and, and strategy uh, and, and in connection with this speech is that I'm the father of five children. My wife and I have been married 51 years. The children are all adults. Uh, number five was, we, we have a nickname for a child that's born seven years after the first four when you're raised Catholic. And I, I won't, it, anyway, it's called an oops baby. But uh, my Molly uh, is very special. Uh, she's accomplished. She danced with the Washington Ballet for eight years. And when she was in high school, she developed a very compact, concise, effective writing style, but not verbose at all. And I, I like to tell people about the book report that she wrote on William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar when she was a sophomore in high school because of this compact style. It, just, it was just amazing. Almost too spare, if you will. But her, and, and a lot of schools, they, they study Julius Caesar when they're sophomores in high school. So Molly, as a 15-year-old, submitted the following book report. Julius Caesar was a great general. He won many battles. He gave long speeches. They killed him. I was hoping for more of a reaction than that, <laughs> but I'll do the best I can with what I got. And obviously, you're, you're, you're afraid of this militaristic presence that I have, you know, uh, even though I'm in Mufti. So at any rate, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Ukraine and, and Russia in the context of national security. And so m most of us know generally what we think national security means, and we can look in the Constitution and see what it means. And the fact is that every four years, uh, an administration, whether it's been reelected or whether it's a new administration, publishes the national security strategy. And, and quite frankly, um, most people don't read it. Even people that practice national security law don't bother to read it because it's filled with platitudes and oh, this is, and it's filled with whatever that the political, the, the particular political party is interested in emphasizing. And, and so uh, it oftentimes bears, bears little in relationship to to reality, but, but, it, but they're important because they're standing documents. They, they, they exist for four years. They have the imprimatur of the sitting president and this particular administration, and they haven't, many things haven't changed in the last three or four administrations. Uh, and I'm gonna to get to that in just a second and then put it in the context of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, president Biden signed off on an interim national security strategy uh, in March of, of last year. And so that's our national security strategy right now. And, uh, and, and, and the priorities always of a national security strategy are defend us physically uh, and whatever that takes. Uh, and so that gets into you know, defense systems and, and, uh, and anti-missile uh, anti systems and the like and what our, what our, what our policy is gonna be. But it's also to protect the US economy because when you talk about national security uh, uh, goals, you know, it's to protect uh, the U.S., the United States fundamental and enduring needs. It's to protect the lives, uh, especially of, uh, and, and the safety of Americans. Uh, it's to maintain United States sovereignty, its values, institutions, and its territory, and keep all that intact. And it's to provide for the prosperity of the nation. And, and that is, in fact, a function of national security.
to provide for the prosperity of the nation and, and, and the economy. And so the challenges are usually economic, political, and military. And in order, the priorities of the interim national security strategy of the United States is number one, China. Now, during the Cold War, you would have said number one was the Soviet Union. That was our greatest concern. But since at least 2011, if not before, the number one concern, the number one priority in national security is China. And after China, Russia, Iran, the Middle East other than Iran, North Korea, and they also put in pandemic, climate change, but the long-term strategic challenge and the long-term strategic concern of the United States national security strategy is China. That's important. And I think it's especially important to this audience because the people in this audience are concerned with the economy, they're concerned with national policy, they're concerned with what's in the future, you know, because you're in large, in, in a large sense, you are in the business of predicting the future or trying to account for what may happen in the future. And so uh, I, I, I think it, it affects the NAIC directly. Now, um, I'll talk in order about Russia and then Ukraine, and then I want to come back to China for obvious reasons. Uh, Russia's goals, if we don't, if everybody doesn't know it, were about a five to seven day campaign, surround Kiev, uh, replace the government, and, uh, and bifurcate uh, Ukraine, if not take all of Ukraine. That was their goal. That's what their intelligence told them they could do. And uh, they obviously failed completely. I got to tell you that, uh, in large part, U.S. intelligence got some of that wrong, too, because U.S. intelligence overestimated uh, the ability of the Russian military to conduct campaigns. That's, that's a side, that's a, that's a side uh, topic. Uh, but what did Russia get wrong? And why did this thing not happen the way they predicted it would happen, the way you know, their president thought it would happen? Uh, one, they underestimated the West. Uh, there had been a great modernization of the Ukraine military, especially since 2014, and that was tied directly to the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea. And they failed to understand or realize or believe that the Ukrainian military had improved that much, that they had better equipment, that they had better training. Uh, they clearly underestimated the fighting spirit of the Ukraines. Um, uh, we've seen that in other places in the world. When it's your home, when you live there, people fight harder. People become more dedicated. And uh, the Russians underestimated the value of that principle, you know, in the Ukrainian population. Uh, pride and anger provide motivation to fight beyond what your capabilities might be otherwise. Um, they also failed to appreciate the leadership of one man, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, the, the president of Ukraine has made a difference. He has made a singular difference. He's made a difference to the Russians and their ability to conduct their campaign, and he's made a difference to the rest of the world in terms of what our, if you will, our attitude is toward Ukraine and what may happen there. Um, so uh, that, that's what Russia planned to do. That's what Russia has not done. And, and that's largely why they haven't done it. Now, on the Ukraine side, shifting to Ukraine and away from Russia, uh, all the things I just mentioned, you know, they, they were able to counter the Russian attack uh, they do have improved military. Uh, they, they clearly have, imp you know, leadership, strong, vital leadership, uh, and they have a lot of pride in their homeland security. And because the West reacted the way it did, they had the benefit of Western intelligence and more Western weapons and the like. But the key, quite frankly, was the intelligence and what they were providing to the Ukrainian military and government. And that enabled them really to, to, 
to push back the Russians and, and, to, and to do as well as they've done. Um, hard to determine what's going to happen. I mean, what, what the president, what President Zelensky did yesterday is, I think, remarkable. That's my personal view, that he shut off the, the gas and oil to the West, essentially saying some of this stuff comes to Ukraine and you're not going to get it because you're not doing enough for us. He basically told the European Union that with his action yesterday. Uh, haven't seen the reaction to that yet by, by the European Union and by the states in the West, but that was a remarkable decision by him. And, uh, and, and, and we'll see how that plays out. Um, can they win? Can they actually defeat Russia and push them all the way back to the original borders? I would say possible. Uh, is, that the, is that the prudent way to do this or should there be something short of a, a total win and some type of a compromise? That, that brings into play a president who seems not to be informed, that is the president of Russia, who seems not to be as well informed as he should be, who seems to have a circle of people that protect him from the bad news and only give him the good news, the classic emperor is not wearing clothes. Uh, so, uh, but I would say it is possible that given enough time that Ukraine uh, could actually push Russia completely back. Um, is a compromise the better way to go? And so what would be the terms of a compromise that would be acceptable to Ukraine and acceptable to Russia? Um, are there off ramps? Are there alternatives? And I would, you know, if you don't know it already, uh, the president of Ukraine has offered uh, the possibility of some type of neutrality. We won't push to get in NATO, um, but uh, maybe we can become like what other countries have done, Austria in 55, uh, Finland and Sweden even now, although that's changing because it looks like they're going to try to join NATO. But, you know, he, he could offer that. He could offer, we won't try to join NATO. Um, and he could also say the second thing that he's kind of offered on the table is, uh, well, okay, maybe we'll say Crimea is Russia. Maybe we'll give up on the idea of, of, of regaining Crimea. So uh, what's important is the response of the Russian president. There hasn't been one. So we don't know if these are workable. We don't know what will happen. It all adds up to the, to the uh, uncertainty that uh, is a part of your business, is a part of your life, is trying to predict, you know, with some type of certainty what's going to happen next. Um, so now I want to talk about China. The, the, the U.S. national strategy focuses on China, uh, as, as I said, and uh, it, actually they, they joked about the three C's of the national security strategy when it was published in 2021. China, COVID, and climate change uh, seem to be the most important things in the, in the way that document was drafted. Uh, and, and then it's sort of like, and also Russia and North Korea and Iran, we're concerned about them too, you know, that type of thing. But China, number one, and that's consistent through the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration. China has become number one. And the reason for that is because China's interest, China's plan is to become the number one economy in the world, the number one military in the world. They want the, the currency to convert to the yen and away from the dollar. They want it to be everything based on China. Now, we like to accomplish things in this country also, but unfortunately, in this country, we run on two-year cycles or four-year cycles. It has to do with the elections. China is not concerned about that. And quite frankly, China's plan is a 20, 30, or 40, or 50-year plan. They're, they'll wait it all out. They're fine with seeing what develops. So there's this personal relationship between the two presidents of, of China and Russia, on, on a personal basis that you've seen with their announcements in February of this year. Uh, and there's also, the, the countries have mutual interests as long as Russia doesn't go too far. There are certain things that Russia could do, for example, uh, going nuclear, that where China would not be able to support that. And China's concerned about the sanctions, so they don't want Russia to go too far. And so right now, China's kind of straddling the fence in terms of the rest of the world. and and. 
will the, will the European Union and will the United States force them to take a position? You know, do, they have, do we have the courage to do that, we being the Western world? Um, right now, they're getting away with straddling the fence and seem to be supporting uh, Russia in, in all efforts. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm not sure how long they can continue doing that if people hold their feet to the fire. Um, that from their perspective, it's not Russia versus NATO. It's Russia versus, uh, it's not Russia versus Ukraine, it's Russia versus NATO, and it's Russia versus the, the West. And they're okay with that. They'll, ju they'll just allow that to happen. Um, they see the West as all declining powers, some to a greater extent than others. And they're willing to wait again till 2050. That's fine. The West can have what it has now, but over time, China will ascend, the West will descend, and China will, will be where it wants to be. And that's why, with regard to the Russia-Ukraine war, and, and I, I commend this thought to you as, as I close my time up here, and that is, if Russia wins, then China wins, because they've supported them, at, at least the way they have so far. If Russia loses, China wins. They're okay with that. Because Russia's, you know, part of the rest of the world, the rest of the world's everybody other than China, and that just makes it easier for China to ascend even more. So I would, I would say, uh, remember that. Uh, it's the essence of, of, of what's going on with national security strategy. I think the people in government understand China's long-term goals and their long-term patience. They're willing to wait everything out. And, and, and I think the leadership in this country understands if Russia wins, China wins. If Russia loses, China still wins. And that's important. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to being with you the rest of the morning, and I'll, I'll be wherever you need me to be to answer questions. Take care.